Hey parents, Dr. Ranger here, pediatric chiropractor at Thrive Chiropractic. And this video is going to be covering helmets, flatheads, torticollis. Why is it happening so much? What can you do about it as a parent? And why the typical approach to just wait and see, let them grow out of it is really not the route that we want to go with these challenges. First, let's just understand what we're talking about because there's several different words that can be used to be describing this. Torticollis and plagiocephaly are the, the technical scientific terms that you'll hear thrown around. Torticollis would be referring to any sort of head rotation preference. So if you find that your baby in the car seat is always looking in the same direction, or maybe their head is tilted to the side really frequently, that is what that's referring to. Frequently, it's gonna be connected to plagiocephaly, which is leading to this flattening in the back of the head. If our head always has one side of it that's facing the back of the car seat, the bed, whatever the surface is, that side is going to start flattening out and not going to have the same rounding and bone growth. So. A few things that you can look for when you're trying to see, is this what's going on with my kid? Um, one is the very obvious, just the flattening. If this gets bad enough, you're going to be able to visibly see as a parent without any medical training, without any background as a provider, you're going to see, wait a minute, when I look down specifically, and I've got a baby Sophia here to help with some visuals. If you're looking down at the top of their head, you'll tend to notice that maybe instead of a nice rounding that's very symmetrical on side to side it kind of pulls in one direction and one side seems a little bit more flattened out or straight that's one thing you can look for the other thing that depending on the age of your kid sometimes they go through a little bit of a hair wearing pattern so depending on how much hair your kid has what color it is you might notice that it wears and they develop a little bit of a bald spot and that bald spot might not be in the middle you might notice it on one side more than the other that's another little clue or a sign that you can pick up on. Uh, the other ones that uh, sometimes will go hand in hand with this, a nursing preference, right? If you're breastfeeding, you might find that your baby is more comfortable on one breast versus the other because of the way their jaw or their mouth has to move. Or maybe, you know, we've heard parents say this, they nurse fine on both sides, but on one side, you have to hold them in more of the football position or some other position, whereas they can go in more of that cross your body move on the other side. Any of those preferences, asymmetries, or tendencies they have would be an indicator to me that they probably have a little bit of that extra torsion or tension. Another thing that is a little trickier to look for, but if you're paying attention, you can sometimes see some eye or cranial asymmetry. You might notice that one eye is a little bit more squinty or a little bit more open. They seem almost offset, like one's closer or farther away. They might not seem as evenly spaced as you think they should. All of those things are indicators that that baby has some extra tension, some extra shifting in stuckness, that's my favorite little scientific word here on this, stuckness in that head and upper neck region. So what that tells us is that we've got to address it. Unfortunately, most of the time you, you might bring those uh, questions, those concerns up with a pediatrician at a two month, three month, four month visit. And typically the phrase that's used or the recommendation is, well, let's just wait and see. They'll probably go out of it. We'll, we'll check in again when you're back at your four month or at your six month or whatever that next appointment is man, that is missing the mark so much. I understand it from their perspective because their training is in so many other areas. It's not physical examination. It's not looking into those details. So they're not necessarily trained to look at it from that perspective. They're going to be thinking about things from some other sort of lens, some other sort of framework. So I get it, but also we need to do better because we need to realize that these things are connected to other pieces of the puzzle. So instead of just saying, hey, let's grow out of it, or maybe at best in that four or six month window when it gets worse, when it's not improving, you go the PT route and you're adding stretches or different things. That is missing the actual issue at play. So that is the one thing I want you to steer away, steer away from as parents is trust your gut on this. Don't let someone just say, hey, let's hold off on this. Let's wait till it gets worse. Let's wait and see. Because more often than not, that is going to just let this problem get more and more challenging. And I bet you know that as a parent, right? I bet you that you and your, even if it doesn't have any sort of um, cranial shape or cranial formation training, you can probably guess it's easier to change a kid's head structure at one month old than it would be at six months or at 12 months, right? You can feel those little soft spots or those squishy parts on the top of their head way, way more pronounced changing way faster in those younger ages. So this is an issue that is so much easier to address earlier on in life, not even just a few months down the road. So we don't want to just go with that wait and see approach. We want to get to the actual cause. So what is it the cause of this? Why are we seeing so many more kids dealing with a helmet 
to correct that head shape or dealing with this head and neck tension and ending up with the PT referrals or other options? Well, it usually comes down to the birth process, either in utero constraint, the way they are positioned in mom's womb, or the way they entered the world has led to a damage, a injury, a stuckness, to use that word again, in this head and neck region. The birth process is really the missing piece of this because it's pretty uncommon that the parents that we're talking to have a boring, uneventful, intervention-free birth. It is more frequently that we're hearing people talk about, well, I got induced, or I had some extra pushing problems where we got stuck for a little bit, let alone the full-blown named interventions like forceps, vacuum extraction, C-section delivery. All of those are going to have a lot of pooling to use Sophia again, we're grab grabbing baby by that head and neck, either with the provider's hands or with some instrument, we're grabbing and pulling, usually turning and twisting at that head and neck region, which means that area is going to be susceptible to way more injury and damage. It's about as simple as this, guys. If you yank a baby out by their head and neck, there's gonna be consequences, right? I don't think I'm, I'm sharing any groundbreaking news with you there, because as a parent, when you've got your precious little newborn that you're sharing with family and you're passing them off to that family member who doesn't really know what they're doing, what are you saying? You're telling them, careful with the head, careful with the neck, hold their head. You know that, guys. We know that babies have these adorable little faces and heads that they can't really control yet. We just gotta remember it when it comes to that birth experience, when we are putting immense amount of force and stress into that head and neck. So that is the number one finding that we see in 80, 90% of these case histories, but there are some exceptions to that, or maybe it was more of that position, just the way they were torqued up or twisted in the womb, or any other number of factors that has led to this. So, without addressing that piece of it, without addressing that upper neck, that C1, C2 occiput area, without addressing that function, we're never really gonna get to the bottom of it. And that comes back to this PT, stretching, exercises, positioning stuff I mentioned earlier, that's all good things, but it's really the combination of that with addressing that upper finding that's going to really get the kid the results and the improvements. Because typically, you know, we'll have parents that are coming in, maybe they've gone through that PT route already or they're in the midst of it, and they've seen changes. It's made a little bit of a difference because they got tips on how to hold their kid or they've done some different stretches, but it's not until we start addressing the underlying tension that they really take off and see the changes that they need. So uh, what might some of those positions be? That is something we talk to parents about all the time. Let me give you a couple quick tips on that because there are some things that you can do to help accelerate that along with addressing that underlying cause. Uh, really some positional stuff is what comes to mind first for me. You probably heard people talk about tummy time. Question we get at Thrive all the time is how much tummy time should we get? Um, Side note, usually kids that are dealing with these issues don't really like being on the tummy, so this makes it kind of challenging. Um, but the question they have is, how much tummy time should I be trying to get for my kid? I really think of that in the opposite sense where tummy time, not being on our back, should be the default mode. And that is how I would reframe it for you guys, is don't think about this as straight tummy time where your baby is on the bed or they're on the mat and they are just face down trying to struggle and lift their head up and work through it that way. Part of tummy time should be that, but think of tummy time as just not on the back time. That could be you holding them. That could be baby wearing. That could be you're lounging on the couch and they're resting on top of you. There are so many things that could go into not on the back time rather than just tummy time. So first off is just think of it that way. The less time we can have on our back, the less pressure that is going to be leading to that because that's what takes place. Say baby Sophia here has that upper cervical subluxation and stress. She only, or at least preferentially, looks to the right side. That means that back right side of her head is always going to be on the surface of whatever she's laying on. That pressure over time is going to not allow her skull to form and to develop like it's supposed to, which means it's gonna start having that flattening. So the more that she's not on her back, the more that that isn't taking place. But then the other benefit of the actual tummy time or the time where she is working on engaging, there's this, uh, this law known as Wolf's Law that basically says bone grows as it is stressed. So when she is on her belly, when she's fighting to lift her head up, all of those muscles on her upper back into the back of the head have to pull at this back of the head. It's lifting up like that. So that pulling and lifting in the back of the head is literally helping form the bone growth in that direction. It's pulling the skull back out. So that can really exponentially increase our results here is if we get more belly time, that pulls back at it and it lets that bone grow faster. Now, if you've had a kid in this situation, you probably can remember when they're on their belly, 
a lot of times if you're, even if they are tolerating it okay, they'll probably have that same cockeyed torsion and twisting that they had on their back when they're on their belly. Which brings us back to we really have to address this cause. We've still got to address that upper neck issue. That's where pediatric chiropractors come in and that's where I'm so, so thankful that we can address these things and get to the bottom of it. Uh, for two reasons. One, it addresses the current issue but then it also prevents some future ones. Uh, what we usually do with kids who are in this scenario is we'll come in, we'll get to meet mom and dad, chat through this case history and the most important piece of that first visit, we'll be doing our scans, digging into the neurology at what's at play and actually measuring that neurological piece of it. That's the coolest thing. We get to not just guess at how their body's functioning, we get to quantify it and objectively measure it. Because the thing is, as much as these are problems, they usually go hand in hand with other newborn issues. Nursing issues and latching problems, reflux, fussy, colicky babies that don't wanna sleep are the ones that are typically dealing with this head rotation preference too. And honestly, it doesn't even stop there. The kids who grow out of that or eventually are beyond those challenges, if they don't address the actual why, those are the kids that tend to end up with more future issues like uh, maybe ear infections, you know, six, 12 months down the road because that same upper neck issue is gonna clog up the drainage in that ENT system. So now we start having the ear infections in those issues. That same neurology up here is what is working at our higher level cognitive functions. So now we're dealing with maybe speech and language delays, motor delays, some of the fine motor movements are getting jammed up because we don't have that, all the way on to school age kids dealing with anxiety, sensory processing challenges, focus issues. We see so many of those later life connections starting at this point. So it's not just a right now thing, it's not just your kid as a baby thing, it's a future trajectory for them. So we've gotta address the cause. We've gotta actually measure and quantify that stress with the scans, with the technology, and then put together a care plan to both take care of this current problem, right? Get them off of this struggle bus that they're on, but also even more so, get them off of that future trajectory that usually comes after this. So. Man, I know that's a lot, that's a big one today, but I hope that helps understand what's really going on. And even more so, I hope that gives you some action steps for your kids. So share this video with a friend who has a little one that you think might benefit from it. Or if this is you, if this is your kid that is struggling, please reach out, send us a message, give the office a call. We'll walk you through that whole process, talk about what it looks like to get your kid scanned, get that gentle, specific chiropractic adjustment game plan started, and we'll get them off this track and get them back to thriving.